Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you all for, for having us here. Uh, we at the Atlantic are very pleased to have a continuing relationship with the Secretary, uh, with the Defense Department. Uh, we cover them rigorously and we'll continue to doing so even after you leave. Um, thank you to 1776 and to everyone on the Atlantic team. Uh, I'm going to um, try to divide this up into three parts, Mr. Secretary. Uh, the first is talking about uh, your relationship with the tech industry and what it means for the future of American defense. Um, second part, we want to talk about some of the, uh, some recent events uh, and everything that that means. Uh, third thing we'd like to do, since uh, you're coming to the end of a term, we're coming to the end of a presidential term, is give us a little bit of a tour of the world, some of the hotspots, some of the challenges for the next president and the next president after that. Um, and then in our fourth hour, we'll take questions. Uh, I actually have a uh, large number of questions already from the audience, and, and I want to lean heavily on the tech questions. But let's, let's start in the, what you might call the Silicon Valley area, even though we're not in Silicon Valley. Let's talk about your, your pretty revolutionary approach to, to managing a relationship with the tech community. Um, you have said that um, you would like to see the Pentagon um, as agile in some ways as the tech startup community. I've been in the Pentagon. It's a lot of things, but it doesn't seem very agile. How, how do you actually transform the place so that you're getting in ideas fast and you're applying them even faster? Uh, well, I don't want to give the impression that we can't be agile because we are agile. And I think we, I, I'll give you some example, Jeff, right off the bat. We've been at war now for 15 years, and that has caused us every single day to have to change, adapt what we're doing. So, so we have a lot of really innovative people. But what I'm getting at when I try to reach out to the tech community, I have two things principally in mind. The first is a tradition that goes back many decades uh, and is one of the reasons why our military is the finest in the world. And that is that we have always had a sh close connection between our technology intensive and innovative community in America, which is unrivaled in the world, and uh, this incredibly important mission providing security for our people and leaving a better world for our children. Uh, and that, you know, you can go back to World War II, you can go back to the jet engine, the communication satellite, the internet itself. Uh, all of these things were things that were done in partnership bet between the innovative community of the United States and our institution. So it does go back a long ways, and I don't want to suggest that we don't know how to do it or haven't, haven't done it. What's different today is that a lot of, not, let me put it this way, Jeff. When I started out, I'm a physicist. When I started out in this business, most of the technology of consequence was developed in the United States, and most of that in government programs. When you say technology, you mean universally? Yes. Yeah. And that's, uh, we're still a big force, but I have to recognize that a lot of technology is commercial and global, and a lot of our innovators are outside of our walls. A lot of our innovators don't know us, have never worked with us, even have um, an uneasy relationship uh, with us. And so I need to reach out and try to build back a bridge to that community, get them inspired by our mission, change the way we do business enough that um, uh, they uh, that we're, we're suitable to the modern innovative lifestyle, the modern innovative practices, uh, and so forth. So it's not a birthright that we're the best at protecting ourselves with technology. I gotta work on that. All my predecessors did that, and I think my successors and my successors' successors and my successors' successors will need to do the same. The well, assumption I've always made is that we're so far ahead in technology that it's very, very hard for other countries and their tech complexes to catch up. But who do you worry about eating our lunch? Do you worry about China and Russia, two traditional adversaries, uh, ever becoming in a position where they can actually be faster and more agile than we are? Make no mistake, they're all very competitive. Uh, our 
enemies are and our potential enemies are extremely competitive. Uh, for whether they're terrorists who, who are working hard, you know, each and every day, all day, to try to think of some way that they can do harm to us, right up to the, the, the potential high-end opponents who, yes, have a technological lag, but are determined to close that. And so it's a competitive world, even as it is competitive in the commercial world. It is competitive in the security world. And if we relax our guard, and we just assume that it's a birthright to be the, be, be the best, that gap's going to close. I can't allow that to happen. Let me ask you a question that a lot of young innovators in this audience, a lot of people have a certain perception of Pentagon culture, Defense Department culture. Um, we have other perceptions of the innovation culture. I'm not suggesting that anyone here has ever smoked pot on a regular basis, but there's a possibility that you might have one or two pot-smoking libertarians in the larger tech community. How do you respond? Again, I'm not making any assumptions. Uh, how do you bridge that gap between traditional security needs and people who are non-conventional from the Pentagon perspective? And the second part of that question is, did Snowden and the controversy surrounding Snowden set you back in making, in building bigger and better bridges to tech companies? Let's start with the second part first. There's no question that Snowden set it back. It created a tremendous amount of suspicion, concern, uh, and uh, uh, disinclination to engage. And I, I, I'm realistic enough to, to know that. I, I, my, my view, I do not condone what Edward Snowden uh, did, and I might as well tell you why. Uh, uh, there are 300 million of us in this country, and uh, no one has the uh, authority or the warrant to arrogate to him or herself the ability to use their position and their access to privileged information for their own purposes. That's just not on. I, none of us can do that. We join and we're, 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 we're part of 300 million people. Um, and so I don't accept that anyone who arrogates to him or herself the ability to so fundamentally affect everyone else when they have no warrant to do that. And secondly, whatever you think of the cause, and now I get, and I get to the cause, uh, which is, you know, we conduct ourselves extremely carefully with respect to the collection of intelligence and that's all other subject uh, to to go into. But um, uh, the uh, harm done was to our international relationships, to our relationship with the tech, with the technology community. I'm just very open and I'm realistic about that. It is what it is. And. Um, uh, also, by the way, our companies overseas, because this is used by our competitors as a way of edging out our own innovative companies. So it's, it's very harmful in lots of ways. Uh, that said, uh, I, I simply have to work with that and try to um, build bridges back of trust and understanding and a willingness to meet people halfway uh, and to build that trust, and we're doing that. And I find that innovators are people who want to make a difference in the world. Uh, and one of the ways they can make a difference is by uh, protecting our people and civilization. And so when they get seized with the mission and they feel that they can contribute to the mission in a way that is compatible with everything else they believe in, and there's every opportunity to do that, uh, in this country and, and, and with the Defense Department, then it you know, really yeah. takes off. It, it, the mission, the mission grabs you. Nothing better than waking up in the morning and being part of this fundamentally important thing. There are a lot of wonderful things in life, but none of them can be had unless we're safe. And uh, that's, that's what we do. And that's what I tell kids, you know, I'm off today, I'm going to go down and spend a few days seeing troops, and I always tell them, you get to get up in the morning and uh, uh, know that you're part of something bigger than yourself. And everybody else in the country gets up to get, and they kiss their kids, and they, they drop them at school, or they go to work, 
and they live their lives and they dream their dreams and and all the things that make life life full and that's not possible. That's mm. Go go to the part about marijuana just for a minute. Well, I mean, we have rules about for that protect uh, 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 us from, in a counterintelligence and security point of view. People are our, our rules are sensible enough and flexible enough that they take into account like modern lifestyle. They're not as up to date as always as they should be, but we work hard at making sure uh, that they are. So it's very different from when I started out. So I don't, I, nobody should assume that they can't serve. Um, I, I think you can give us a try. Right. Uh, I'm going to stay on tech for one, one more minute. Uh, we, we were speaking about this earlier. Uh, the assumption has always been that innovation comes from within the system, you're saying that you've reached a tipping point maybe where, where a lot of innovation is coming from outside uh, the system. Can you give us one or two examples of, of hardcore defense applications that have come uh, that help yeah, Let me just say, it, I don't know if we've reached a tipping point. We do a lot yeah. of Really I mean, DARPA is still DARPA. I mean, the, the you act do, activities. You do things that nobody has an interest in doing except us um, because there's no commercial application. I mean, nobody's building hypersonic vehicles because there's nothing to do with that. We need to do that, but nobody else can do that. So I'm, I'm, not everything we do can be bought or absorbed from the outside. But yeah, I'll be very specific. Um, we have uh, our defense digital service. Uh, which is our way of bringing people in who are from the outside, working all our most important companies. Somewhere here is Chris Lynch, by the way. Who, Chris, who's the director of the Defense Digital Service, the only, uh, and he leads a bunch of people who walk around looking like him uh, in the <laughs> Pentagon uh, all day. And they're not there for life, Jeff. They come in for a year or so, and they work on things like um, protecting our nuclear command control system from being hacked. That's a pretty important example, right? So that's the kind of thing where best practices and the talent of people from the outside have made a very material difference to what we're all right. Um, let me turn to some uh, recent events. Uh, the first question is a simple question. Uh, I'm sorry. Okay tech issues. Uh, uh, the first question is a simple question. Uh, has the transition team of the president-elect been in touch with you yet? The, uh, we have procedures in place. The transition team hasn't arrived at the Pentagon yet. These, these, these practices, by the way, were settled upon weeks ago before the election was concluded. This is normal. And, and I, I just want to say, Jeff, well, but you here, haven't met with the transition I, I am, team yet. They, they have not come yet. They're expected, I think, sometime this week, but that's up to them. But we're ready to welcome them and to help the new team to get started. And I want to emphasize that because this has been going on for 240 years. I myself have witnessed transitions in the past, and I am extremely proud of two things about us. Uh, the first is that not only I, and I have been extremely careful about this all these many months of the election campaign, but all of our senior leadership have, have um, adhered to our tradition to stand apart from the political process. And so you haven't heard us talking. That's an important principle in this country. And I'm extremely proud that we've done that. And then the second thing is, I am committed to an orderly transition to our new commander-in-chief, President-elect Trump. I will, uh, th that is something, you know, all my predecessors, my entire life and for generations before that have done. So we're going to do it to standard, we're going to do it warmly, we're going to do it to the best of our ability so that we hand off things to the new administration in the best way we possibly can. So you've spent an incredible amount of time building multinational coalitions to fight ISIS uh, most uh, noticeably, but the other other areas, obviously. Um, the the president-elect spent a lot of time during the campaign disparaging NATO, disparaging alliances. Um, the next time you talk to our allies in NATO or elsewhere, what are you going to tell them? Well, now you're... 
<laughs> I'm going to repeat what I just said, which is I'm, I'm not going to speak about, and I certainly cannot speak for, the new administration. Uh, I can certainly speak about what NATO is doing these days. Um, and, uh, you know, NATO was founded uh, to fight the Cold War. Uh, and it did that. And when it, w and I remember the days when the Cold War ended and we all were saying, well, what's NATO going to do now? Its raison d'etre is gone. It turned out that uh, along came something shortly thereafter, which was the, well, first of all, NATO began the process of rebuilding Europe and, and, and uh, reintegrating countries, including reaching out to Russia, by the way, it was an important thing. And I was part of that. I was, I, I, was, I was in the Defense Department in the 90s, and this was my responsibility. Um, but along came the Balkans, for example, and the slaughter of people in the Balkans. And NATO rose to that challenge. And did and 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 that was a example of a community of nations that saw things similarly, saw a need and met them, met it together. Uh, then subsequently, uh, after 9/11, uh, uh, NATO worked with us in Afghanistan and has been working with us ever since to make sure that Afghanistan doesn't once again become a place from which attacks on America or France or Germany or the United Kingdom or anywhere else in Europe uh, are launched from. So it is a it is a community of nations that have effectively worked together, but it's it's constantly in 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 a process of change. But let me let me rephrase it slightly to say, what is your message to your NATO allies going forward about American stability and American continuity? Well, I I, I have no warrant, obviously, to speak for a future administration. Um, uh, the only thing I would say is engage with the new administration, uh, you know, work with them, um, stay committed to the values and the principles that we have stood for. Um, uh, you know, remember that uh, we have a lot of people who are trying to attack all of us collectively, and we're much better at protecting ourselves if we can find a way to work together. Let's talk about the operation uh, in Iraq and, and also Syria. I, I would like to hear a, a quick status report on that. And I would also like to hear, and it's not just criticism that came from the president-elect, but this idea that it was wrong to telegraph an attack going forward, was re that, that we should have launched a, quote, sneak attack on Mosul rather than telegraph this. Uh, tell, us, tell us about the buildup and tell us about where we sure. are at the moment. Well, the campaign has been, uh, is one that we designed and launched, uh, myself and the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, uh, Joe Dunford, and the president approved geez, a year ago now. And we have, and it's, it's its uh, objective in Iraq and Syria is to destroy ISIL there because we need to destroy the fact and the idea that there can be an Islamic State based upon this ideology. And it needs to start there. I, I, I just want to say that it, it's there, it, that is necessary, it's not sufficient. Uh, so we also need to operate against it in R wherever it arises, Libya, Afghanistan and so forth, and then uh, absolutely we need to protect our own people. And we do that every single day, protect ourselves from, from attack. But to get back to Iraq and Syria, this was a campaign plan that was we put together last fall. Mosul is uh, uh, Iraq's second largest city, and it and Raqqa are the two central nodes of ISIL. So they have to be destroyed, and so our plan very early on involved the systematic envelopment uh, of those two forces, of those two cities, and the destruction of ISIL uh, within them. So for a year now, we've been planning that and working with the Iraqi security forces, and which include the Kurdish Peshmerga, to take the Mosul uh, example. And it's important, to, we're using them and we're enabling them. It's important that I mention, Jeff, that they, what we've learned from 15 years is that we can defeat ISIL, but we have to, we, this time we want to make sure they stay defeated, right? And to, for them to stay defeated, local forces must 
consolidate the defeat, must, must, must keep the peace after we've won the war. That's why we're working with the Iraqi security forces and the Peshmerga. So this, this campaign and, and its objectives of Mosul and Raqqa have been quite clear. They're absolutely necessary. And we built up the combat power to do them very systematically according to a, um, uh, a plan that, as I said, we put together a, a year ago. And the secrecy or sneak attack component of this was not salient in overall there, success. There are secret tactics involved there, but the fact that we're going to Mosul and Raqqa is, is clear because they're the two biggest cities. Right. And it's actually important uh, that the enemy know that, uh, and that, the, that uh, ISIL everywhere else know that we intend and will destroy them. Why is it important for them to know specifically because that? You gotta, because I, the inspiration factor uh, around the world. That's why it's so important to destroy them in Iraq right. and, and Syria so that people know this is not a happening thing. This is something that's going to be stamped out. Right. Let me um, ask you a, 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 qu a related question from an a audience member. Uh, how would you rate the biggest threats to the United States over the next five years? Uh, North Korea, Russia, China in the South China Sea, uh, and then add in the sort of the, the Islamic yeah, State well, threat. You left out Iran. Um, and they ran out of room and, on the card. And we left out ISIL. <laughs> well, uh, it's a uh, it, uh, now these are all very different situations. And answer this in, in the length I of a tweet, if you can. Yeah, I know it's an all essay. Very yeah. Situations. By no means are we at war with all of these and so forth. But if you're if you're saying what are the things that we stand vigilant against, those are the sort of big five: uh, uh, ISIL, uh, malign a activity by Iran in the Gulf and the deterring attack upon our friends and allies. North Korea, our slogan there is fight tonight. We've been there for decades and decades and, I'm, and you know, every single night we stand guard to deter attack against South Korea and attack upon them ourselves from North Korea. Russia and China are different situations where we have a, a mixed relationship, where we work together, where we see common purpose, uh, but there are also respects in which those relationships uh, are competitive, and, and being the Defense Department, we're realistic about that. And then, Jeff, well, what we're at, those are the five that are on our minds today. But life is long and our history is long. So as I think in the spirit of this audience about my successor's successor and, my, and decades down the road, and one reason to be agile is we're pretty good at not knowing what comes next. Uh, and so I have to be realistic that these are the things that I focus on today, but I also need to make sure that we're ready for whatever things that we cannot foresee today, as ready as we can possibly be. Right. This is a, uh, a, a question that I see in various forms throughout these cards. Um, how can DOD or federal contracting in general keep up with the speed? Um, uh, not technology that is unique to defense. I'd be crazy if I'm not if I were not farming what is outside our walls. Um, I, I do you want that, these people I, out here to come in to you, or do you not yeah, care I'm anymore? Realistic about well, but though I want to be careful about come in doesn't mean you have to spend your whole life. You have to, you have to give your whole life uh, to it. That's why the defense digital service is so important. People who come there are giving it a try. They come in for one project or one year, and then they go back to the companies from which they came, which are all the marquee companies. Um, and uh, I know they're not all going to stay. And by the way, Ash Carter got into this years and years ago, and a, 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 an elder in my field of uh, theoretical particle physics, who had been part of the Manhattan Project, said, you have a responsibility given the knowledge that you have to contribute to the greater good. 
and I want you to take one year off. <laughs> one year, I don't know, you know, whatever, 35 years later, here I am. Uh, and, and I did, and it, it stuck with me for two reasons. First of all, I found out, yeah, I actually could make a difference. I knew something that mattered. And so I felt like I was counting. And the other thing was that, I, that what I was working on was about the most important thing you could possibly work on. Take those two things together, that what you do is having an effect and what, and what you're working on really matters. That's about as magical as it can be for somebody who, who is innovative and, and, and so I was hooked. Um, I don't expect everybody to get hooked. So I'm trying to make us permeable enough that people can come and go. Some people will want to serve in uniform, some people will want to serve in the civil service, and that's great, and I want them to. That's why I'm going down to basic training in Texas uh, day after tomorrow. But I know not everybody's gonna do that, not everybody in this audience, but give us a try, work on something, and even if that's all you ever do, for the rest of your life, you'll look back and say, you know what, you can, you can tell people, I, I did something that really, really mattered. Um, and if I had stopped with the first thing I worked on, which is so uh, an old Cold War project, probably most of you wouldn't even know what it is, I'd be proud of that. I'd be proud even now if I'd not done nothing else since. Uh, one more, time for one more question, please. Um, I'm sorry, am I not holding it up okay? Yeah. <laughs> uh, you can give him a different mic, but if he doesn't know how to hold it, it's still not gonna work. The, uh, <laughs> What is the best path for startups to get the information they need from the DOD to design and market their products? Um, uh, uh, well, uh, the questions are coming extraordinarily specific to me, by the way. Yeah, no, this yeah. is this this is good. And the the place I one of, one of the, the first place I'd send people right now is our Defense Innovation Unit Experimental, DIUX. Now, I have three outposts of that that are in three of our technology hubs. I intend to create more. Um, but it doesn't matter where they're located. They're a place for you to connect. And what they'll do is, is help you understand how to connect with the customers. And we have lots of different customers doing lots of different things. How to work with the government. And, and, and the government is just another customer. What makes us unusual is this. And it would, which is that we, it's not our money and we know it's not our money. So when you work with the government, you're working with people who know it's not their money. It's your money, it's the taxpayer's money. And that is one of the reasons why we have some rules and so forth. And I'm trying to make sure those rules don't slow us down unnecessarily, but I, I have to respect the rules because it's not our money. Um, and so we need to be fair, we need to have competition and so forth. That's just part of the way the government does stuff because it's not our money. I don't want to have you um, nerd out too much right now, but I do have this. Uh, it's easy, I know, on occasion, yeah. Um, but I, I do want to know something about autonomous warfare, and, and I want you to talk a little bit in the sort of almost a science fiction vein, although maybe it's not science fiction anymore. When do we reach the point uh, where we're not going to need pilots anymore in our planes? When do we reach the point where the battle, the battle space is taken over by robots? And what are the, what are the technological and moral complications associated with this. Well, we're f flying airplanes right now. No, I'm uh, talking about when is the end of pilots is what I'm talking have, about. We don't have, have uh, people in them. Um, and uh, systems in the warfare area, like elsewhere in life, get more and more powerful and capable of making tactical decisions. but. The thing I want to say to you, Jeff, is we are very clear, and I actually, when I was Deputy Secretary of Defense, four years ago I now, issued a directive to the entire department which, said, which reminded them that when it comes to the use of force on behalf of the American people, there always needs to be a human being involved in making those decisions. And I think that's an incredibly important principle. So there can be more and more automation built into a system, but when it comes to the very solemn job of using force to protect the American people, I think they're, I, I'm absolutely certain uh, that uh, our public officials and our public will always insist that there be a human being 
um, involved in making those decisions. Let me ask you one final question about America's role in the world. And this is not a, a question that's necessarily specific to the election that we've just had, but you and I have talked before about the, this president and his foreign policy doctrine, national security doctrines, presidents before that. Uh, since World War II, the United States has played a, a role, uh, sometimes it's played it well, sometimes less well, but it's played a role as the uh, global guarantor of stability, uh, especially in the three regions of the world that are most crucial to American national security interests, East Asia, Middle East, and Europe. Uh, do you believe that, based on what you see about the world as it's organized, the rise of other powers, um, the proclivities uh, and dispositions of the American people. Do you believe that this is something that continues inexorably, or are we heading, in your view, into a kind of different direction about the, the, the role that America is going to play? No, I, I, I do think much of it will uh, continue. We remain a exceptionally strong country with an amazingly bright future and innovative people tremendous military strength, but that's not our only strength. We have a very resilient economy. We have a, the best innovation system in the entire world. And then there's something else, um, which uh, is, uh, I always tell the troops, I say, let me tell you what I hear from foreign leaders who work with you. They like working with you. And why is that? It's because you conduct yourselves in a very decent way. And the things that we stand for, uh, matter to people and appeal to people. And, um, you know, it's not going to be 1945 again, where the rest of the world is in ruins and the United States is the only uh, power left uh, standing. And we actually have worked now for 70 years since World War II to help other nations to rise and prosper, and we welcome that. But we also stand up for the things that we stand up for, and we remain a very influential, not dispositive, but an influential power uh, in the world. And I expect that to continue. Keeping America great. Thank you very much, Secretary Thanks Carter. I appreciate, I appreciate it. it. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you all for being here. Thank you.